Okay, now we're going to get to running an actual test, uh, starting from scratch. Um, we're going to do it assuming you got a black box, our electronics. If you have a Superflow Flowcom, you know, it's going to be very similar. If you're going to do things manually, um, we're going to show you a lot more stuff than what you need, but the idea is basically the same. So if you're running a test, if you're starting from scratch, and I've never had the program before, it's not too important what test you have here on the main screen opened up before you start your test. Once you start running your test, and let's say you have a certain pattern of how you do things. You have your small block Chevy test and a small block Fords and stuff. When you're running a new test, it's best to open up an old test that's going to be very similar. You know, it's going to have all the port sizes, the valve sizes. It's going to probably have the ranges on your flow bench you use, the lifts and the LVDs. All this stuff is going to be there. And that's going to be a very nice template for you to start your new test. But we're going to assume you're starting from scratch. Now, in the book, nobody wants to read the book, but here on page 111, we example 4.1. All of chapter 4 is good for you to at least breeze through and look at the pictures. And it, it tells you how to start different types of tests. But you can also see... You can also see here in Appendix 7, we talk about the new Easy Start Wizard we had in version 3.5. And we know no one's going to read the book anyway, so we have this new feature we put in. So let's assume we're going to start a new test from scratch, but we have filled in our master bench spec. We have put in the flow bench specs and stuff. Okay. Uh, we'll put in our cal uh, ranges here. We've got our calibrations all set up and everything. And anyway, you can see this. It said that these specs do not match the master bench specs because this is some other test. This is some example test. But our master bench specs are known by the program, and we actually have some electronics here. So anyway. Okay. So we've got a particular test on the main screen. It's not going to be very fussy because we're going to change most of it. We're going to click on the Easy Start Wizard. If you're following in the book, the old method was just click on New Start New Test. It is actually faster and it does not walk you through as much stuff, but it is a fast way of starting a new test. But we're going to go the full route with the Easy Start Wizard to show beginners how things are done. It says, do you want to save your changes on this test before we get started? And we're going to say, no, that's not important. Okay. And it says, do you want to run another test similar to this test? And if we were going to run a test real similar, I would say yes. But we're going to say no, so we can go through a whole bunch of stuff and just illustrate everything in the Easy Start Wizard. And the first thing here is, what are your flow bench settings? Now, it knows that we have, and you'll notice this is different than before, it knows what our master bench specs is. Master bench specs we covered in a previous movie. Uh, it knows we got a Superflow 600. We know we got Performance Trends Black Box, and we know it's on COM1. We already found it, um, and we're taking 10 readings, 10 readings to average for each data point. So we know that's right. For example, if we change this now to a 1020, it said you've selected to change your flow bench specs. That means you have to enter all new flow bench settings. Are you sure you want to do this? Now, it's going to, if we say yes, it's going to say, well, go into the flow bench specs and do it. And I'm going to say, nope, I don't want to do that. I'm going to want to back up to this and say, nope, that was wrong. I do have the 600. And now you see it says everything's fine. What test pressure do you want to run? I'm going to say 28 and 28. Okay. How many rows of data? Now, this is not real fussy, but it's just asking you. If you put in too few, if you put in, let's say, five here and you need more, you can always add it later. And if you have extra rows like shown on this test that are blank, no big deal there either. So we'll just leave it at 18. That should be plenty. Here is the bore diameter for the bore adapter you're using. you got your head mounted on a bore adapter to your flow bench. Like we said before, if you run tests on a 4-inch bore adapter and somebody else runs tests on a 4 and an eighth inch bore adapter, 4.125, you're going to get different numbers. The bigger the bore adapter, generally the better the flow numbers. But if you're running the engine or the head on a 4-inch bore, why test on a 4 and an eighth inch bore adapter? Because you're fooling yourself. 
So, but this is very good information to record. It's going to help you figure out why tests don't repeat in the future. Same with this, your intake adapter and your exhaust adapter, meaning what is on the entrance to the port on the head. Do you put anything there? Maybe nothing. Maybe you clay it up a little bit so it's smooth. Maybe you got a special radius inlet or something. Or maybe you want to type in something special that we did before. Now that might mean something to your shop, the SS333 adapter, whatever. And we got no adapter on the exhaust. Again, we've talked about this, but for almost everything, you're going to calculate the CFM from data entries. Data entries meaning range, uh, test pressure, flow pressure. On a 110, it could be temperatures and such. So for most everybody, you're going to use that. Do you want to record any extra information? The program will not do any corrections on this because, like Superflow says, there's no corrections needed. But if you want to record extra data, this will open up columns for you to record extra data. We're not going to say anything to that. Just leave them all. Don't do it. Test pattern. You can see here we were going even inches of even increments of L over D, which almost nobody uses. But um, I'm not saying it's bad. I think actually it's probably a better way of doing it. But nobody does it that way. They go in even lift increments. So say, I'm going to say, no, I don't want to do it that way. And then it asks me, how do you want to do it? And how I do want to do it is I want to do an even in lift increments of inches and 0.05. And I want to go up to 0 0.7, 700 thou lift. And I do want to include uh, a leakage point, a zero lift point, so I can check leakage and correct for leakage. You see here on the old test, it's got three CFM of leakage on it. So I want to check that. Go next. It says, do you want to do pitot tube velocities? And I'm going to say yes. This is port velocity mapping. And I want to do nine points at two lifts. And I don't want to correct for barometer. I just want to do it velocity because uh, this particular black box does not have a barometer sensor in it. And I want to do it at 0.3 inch lift and 0.6 inches of lift. It's where I want the program to say, okay, let's do uh, velocities, port velocities. Okay. What are your, what is the bare minimum head data we know, we need to know? And this is it. How many valves? How many ports, and what are the port or the valve diameters? Do you want to type in a new operator? Or do you want to pick one? I'm going to pick one, or I could just type in could just type in Kevin, put a head number in. Like I said, some shops are very fussy. They have a particular format for their head number. And you just can't type in a number. You got to be use a particular data format. So we have this screen here and there's a preference to force you through that method to make sure you got head numbers that are always consistent with how your shop might have head numbers set up. And here, I want to add a new test because this I want to put in Joan because this head belongs to our test customer, Jones, and I want to keep all his heads separate from everybody else's. So now you can see I've added Jones as a new folder, and that's where this test is going to be saved. Now, test comments. You can type them in here anytime you want, change them anytime you want, but this just is saying, what do you want to do to them? Do you want to erase them, start with nothing? Do you want to... Uh, Restore the original comments and maybe type in something new to carry over into the new test. So it's whatever you want. I'm going to do this. Um, I could have blanked it out, I guess. So I'm going to restore the original. There they are. And uh, and I don't know. You you could you get the idea. But anyway, that's the last thing that's going to happen. You click on finish. We're going to start a new test. And there you can see our lift and L over Ds are in. Our ranges are blanked out. Test pressure and stuff is all blanked out. But we have all these velocity reading points. We can enter velocity readings. Now, we're only gonna, it's only going to allow you to do it at 3 tenths of an inch and 6 tenths of an inch lift. But anyway, so now we've got our new test started.
Okay, so we've got that going. First thing you do is click on electronics. Here's our data recording screen. And if you've been seeing the previous movie files, you've seen this before. And here you can see uh, we're not exactly at zero. We can re-zero our flow readings here. Our, I'm sorry, our pressure sensors by clicking on re-zero pressure sensor readings. Yep, I want to do it. Do I want to use them? Yep. Okay. Now let's jump in fact, plus and minus a little bit. Okay. Our first data point is one over here, so it's used to check leakage. We don't have a range in there yet. On this screen, if there is no range, it'll default to one. So let's say we're on range two here. And you see it fills in a two over there. We're on data point one at zero valve lift. This is the one that we would use to get a leakage number. I just want to show you something else real quick. You can resize this screen also. If it doesn't resize for you, there's a preference setting that lets you resize it and such. But okay, let's say we're on range two now. We've set the bench. We're going to turn the bench on now and record a reading. Now what I did is, and this is a little difficult because I'm simulating a flow bench here. I don't have a real bench with me. Is I simulated uh, the conditions, and you can see here, I got 5 CFM, which is a very high leakage number, but it's saying basically we got um, 5 CFM of leakage on range 2. So what you would do then is close the screen out, type in 5 here for leakage, and you can see as soon as you do that, it drops the CFM reading down to 0 here on this first point because at 0 lift, you should not have any flow. So that's how it works. Typically, you're going to have readings much more like 1 or 2 CFM, not up around 5, but it's just because I'm simulating things here and I want to save some time get going here. So anyway, let's go back up here. Now that we've typed in leakage for that first point, and we're going to want to go to the second data point here. And the second data point is at uh, 0.05 lift, and we're still on range 2, and we're going to get some real numbers for that. Okay, so we got some real data coming in here, and all you do is you've got the, um, the range set. You're on data point 2, just press the F1 key, and you can see here in the upper left, it is recording the 10 readings up there. And then it just automatically jumps to the next point. So we'll set the next point, and let's say this happened to be on range 3. So we make that change here. Now, you would not have to be making this range change if you had a pattern. You'd copy the pattern. But because we're starting from scratch, we have to tell it this stuff. So let's get a data point here. And again, we just press on F1. And watch up here in this point when we press F1. It's telling you it's recording 1 of 10, 2 of 10, etc. And then it's not jumping to the next data point. And if we slide this out of the way, you can see we're filling in our data here. And we're drawing our graph over here. Now, because I'm just simulating this without a flow bench, we're getting goofy looking numbers over here. But it's, it's giving you the idea how it works. So you just go through this. And I'm just going to uh, record F1. Let's say I had the new valve lift set. And I had set it back to 28 inches. And we're still on range 3. I set up the new valve lift of point 2. I tell it we're still on range 3. We're on data point 5, as you can see over here. So basically, we're just setting the lift and dialing in the test pressure back to about 28. We're going to set the lift to point 0.25, set it at 28, press F1. And you can see here, on our graph, we're getting a very strange looking flow curve, but that's because I'm simulating things here. Now, we're at 3 tenths of an inch lift. We're going to record the data at this point. Maybe now we're up to range 4. We tell it that. Press F1. And when it gets done here, when it gets done here, it's saying, do you want to record your point velocities for a 3 tenths of an inch lift? Click on Cancel, and it won't ask you again on this port if you want to record this anymore. 
You could have also done it beforehand up here, clicked on port velocity before it prompted you for this, and it would have said which point, six tenths or three tenths, and it would have filled in the data then. But let's say, yes, I want to do this now. Okay. So what you're going to do now is you're going to get your pitot tube and you're going to put it in different positions inside the port. So I'm going to shrink this up a little bit. And you can see we're on velocity point number one and it's highlighted here in blue. So it's the upper left corner. We got our pitot tube in there. We're getting some kind of port velocity number here. So uh, we're going to hold it in that position. And when you get in that position, you're just going to press F1. And it takes three readings real quick. And you can see here it jumps to the next port position here, top middle, at three tenths of an inch lift. And we're just going to go through this. And I'm going to do fill it out um, while I turn this off, delay it so you don't have to watch all this stuff. And when you get done, you'll see here it jumps to the next point. Now, if you want to take a look at what you did here, we're going to close out of this. We're going to jump out of that and click on one of these points, velocity points here, and it's going to show you your little positions here. And it's highlighting the position you just clicked on. You click on that position, it's going to highlight that position. You can get a little graph here of... The different here's the different velocities here. We didn't get up to yellow, which is 240, but we had some 210s and some 180s in there, and it's showing you that here's the high velocity areas and here's the low velocity areas. Now you didn't have to do that, and we're going to get out of this by just clicking on a different point, not a velocity point. It goes back to the normal CFM graph. We're going to go up here. We, let's why don't we just click on that graph so it knows this is the row we want to start in 0.35. And we're going to go over here, and we're just going to continue our test as soon as it establishes communications again. So we're just going to finish this test out, going F1 the whole way. Basically, set test pressure, set the valve lift, set the test pressure, set the correct range, because we don't have the correct range in here, nothing's filled in, and press F1. Now what I'm going to do, because we don't have these ranges set here, just to say sometime, just to illustrate something else you can do in the program, is I'm going to click here, and I'm going to type in a number and then press the down arrow key. And it's going to jump to the next row. So I'm going to do, type in a 4, and just down arrow, 4 arrow, 4 arrow. And from history I know that this is going to be on range 5 for the next 5 rather than filling it in in the electronic screen. And now I go back to the electronic screen, and it says I'm on data point 16, but I know that's not right. I'm actually on data point 8. And that's on range 4, and I'm just going to continue uh, running out my tests here. So here we are ready to record our last data point at uh, data point 15, range 6, or 5, I'm sorry. Press F1 for this one, and we're done. And you can see here it also asked us what to do here at six tenths of an inch lift. We want to record the velocities, and we did and recorded the pitot tube velocities. And you can see our flow curve here looks like junk because this is on a sort of a simulated bench here. I was simulating it on the bench. But you go to exhaust now, you switch to the exhaust, or maybe the second cylinder, or maybe the second cylinder could be a different modification to a particular cylinder. And then you'd say here that cylinder three is actually um, something like that. So you can keep track of your notes. It's uh, really important to keep good notes when you want to go back and see what did you do. These notes up here are real important. So maybe if you just wanted to do uh, no exhaust on this, maybe you're just testing on an intake port. So you clade up the short churn radius. You go up here, and you just start over again. Now what happens here in the program, because you had ranges on the previous port, it will now copy them over to the second port. 
if you went from range of intake cylinder one to three, and there was range information in one, I'm sorry, it will copy it over to three. So you can see we're trying to save you steps and think ahead for you. So here we got our ranges. So now all you got to do is, assuming that the ranges are the same, you just uh, set your test pressure, set your flow pressure. I'm sorry. Set your valve lift. Again, we should check leakage because it could be different here. Or if you know it's going to be the same, you just type in the 5. Just carry over the 5 that you had from this one. Just type that in as 5. I'm sorry, 5. And then enter. And, uh, and just go. And just um, go up here and start recording your data. Now we don't want to record data point one, or you could if you want to record leakage, but go to data point two and um, start recording your data. So that is basically how you run tests. Close out of that screen, let's say you got done with this thing. The thing you want to remember, this is a very good habit on all software. When you've recorded some data, do a save. If you click on save, it's going to save it to the same name. If for some reason you want to do a save as, it'll ask you for a new name. And then you could say, put a two on the end. So it knows that, or maybe three, that this is now I'm going to start working on cylinder three. So it's a very good habit to get in. And you'll see once in a while, saving to temporary file. What that saving to temporary file little message box that comes up here once in a while is, the program is always saved, not always. But once in a while, we'll save a backup copy. So if the program dies, your computer dies or something, you go back in, and it's going to say, do you want me to restore the test, all the data, as best it can, to where you were right before it died? So that's something good to know, too.